and welcome to Most Recent Save, the podcast where we talk to influential voices in games and pop culture about the pivotal moments, challenges, and triumphs that shape their lives and careers. It is a journey through the pathways of life where the focus is not just on the destination, but the stories that shape the journey in between the save points. I am your host, Dr. Rachel Cowart. Today, we are joined by Paul Fisher, a contractor and senior technology advisor for the U.S. State Department's Global Engagement Center. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, Rachel, I thought this was a podcast about games, and it is. Hold tight. Paul leads the department's efforts to train vulnerable populations to pre-bunk disinformation using video games and other forms of media, and is an outspoken advocate for the importance of digital literacy. Welcome, Paul. Woo, Rachel, thanks so much for having me. This is exciting. I'm so excited to have you. We've been friends for a while now. Yes, and I mean, so much so that I get to be your inaugural uh, yes. guest on the podcast. Thank you. Yes, I'm I'm grateful to have you. Now, before we begin, there are some caveats we have to open with. So I want to <laughs> give you the floor to start with that. As you mentioned, I am a contractor with Accenture Federal Services, uh, working for the U.S. Department of State's Global Engagement Center, and I am joining you here today in my personal capacity, Paul the person, uh, not Paul the representative of the government. Honestly, Paul, I've known you for a few years, but when I read your bio and I said this to you before the show started, I was like, you are clearly the most interesting person I know. You were in the Peace Corps. You co-led a cultural antiquities task force, which sounds like, I don't know, Indiana Jones in real life. <laughs> That's definitely what people think when they hear that. Uh, the reality is much more boring, unfortunately. Far fewer boulders to be running oh. from. The boulders, I guess, are more metaphorical and bureaucratic than literal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wah, wah. Well, still interesting. It looks great on a resume. Um, and then games, of course, are what brought us together originally. Um, this game called Cat Park, which if anyone follows me anywhere, you know, I've been talking about it ever since I ever heard about it. Yes, yeah. Cat Park. <laughs> <Yes>. um, <laughs> Rachel is an incredible advocate for Cat Park. Uh, number one champion. That's it. That's Thank it you. for sure. No question. So let's back it up before before Cat Park, the pre Cat Park days. Let's talk about Paul there the was Human. Never a time before Cat Park was there. We've always, <laughs> we've always been a Cat Park. That's true. <laughs> That's true. I mean, our relationship has been encapsulated by Cat Park. But you were a person before you met me, and I would love to learn about Paul the person. So why don't you regale us with a little a little trip back to down memory lane? Yeah, sure. So I grew up in Southern California. Um, and like, you know, grew up playing video games. Um, I have two older brothers. They're eight and 10 years older than I am. And when I was a newborn, my parents moved from the California Bay Area down to Southern California for my dad's job. And so to like help my parents, help my brothers like make friends and integrate into the neighborhood, they got them a Super Nintendo. Uh, and so like sort of grew up like watching them play video games um and you know like I, I, there's a funny story i don't really remember this but uh they they tell they regale this story my parents that like uh it's like they had to go to like parent teacher night and um you know, my my parents are a little bit older, so my brothers were like, you have to dress like normal parents. You need to dress like cool parents. And so my parents, like, went upstairs and, like, changed into, like, crazy costumes, like, game costumes, and, like, came down like they were going to go to parent-teacher night. And my brothers were like, no, 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 okay. You, go, you can dress normally. You can dress normally. Um, like, when they when they got the Super Nintendo for my brothers, they wanted to be like the cool parents and be able to beat my brothers at the game. So like before they gave it to them secretly, they were playing up in their bedroom. Uh, and then, you know, very promptly like got the floors wiped with them. Like they got destroyed. With, like, I the love that. Yeah. I love that. My parents, uh, my father was also older compared to like the parents of my peers mm -hmm. and he would never, never play games. That's so fun. I very distinctly, oh man, okay, this is when my brother David was in high school, so somewhere between 1996 and 2000, um, he got an N64. And like, I remember, you know, we like woke up early because it was a school day, 
and my parents like sent him on this um like a, a clue what, what's that called a scavenger <laughs> hunt like, a scavenger hunt thank you like all around the house and the last clue was like what what rhymes with lovin and the m64 was inside of the oven Oh, wow. uh, and it was like we were not expecting this at all my like the n64 had just come out my mom had like called every store you know in the like to- the county looking for an n64 and, wow and kind of like... you had cool parents okay it, so games yeah. were always like central it sounds like especially to you and your brother's interactions yeah yeah very much so what was it like being player number three um <laughs> i it was the worst yeah i was gonna uh, my, say <laughs> yeah always the worst and my middle brother david he is like the best at games he like i don't know if i've ever beaten him at anything my parents would like make them go easy on me i think was, oh, like the bottom they? line <laughs> they, they would make you play well you know i was player two uh, okay. my parents did not make my brother go easy on me i have so mm-hmm. many memories of like playing spy versus spy and just oh, yeah. always losing yeah uh, always yeah. That's very mm. frustrating as the younger. I can commiserate as the younger. Totally. Sibling. That's kind of the early childhood. I went. So your brothers are much older than you. So you were when you were in high school. They were not. Were games still central to kind of your social spaces then, or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so you know, after the N sixty four, I remember getting a GameCube and playing again Super Smash. And then I, I've been thinking about this recently that like this game that was like my first like puzzle game that I beat all the way through was Prince of Persia, the sands of time on the GameCube. Great game. That was such a phenomenal game. I, yeah. I think about that game. Well, like now that there's a new one for the switch, I was like, Oh man, like yeah. I think I might need to go back and play this game. It's a and, great game. Oh my God. Yeah. It, it is a great game. And like the sense of pride that mm-hmm. I felt when I, when I beat that game, I was like, mm. wow, I did this. I spent hours working on this game and I did it. It's funny that it's Prince of Persia, considering how your life then became a life of uh, foreign <laughs> service. Yes, I try not to think too deeply about like <laughs> maybe the influence of that game and the animated Aladdin movie and then watching mm. Lords of Arabia with my dad. I try not to think too hard about like, is that like directly causal within a life spent like studying and living in the Middle East? Maybe. <laughs> I mean, it it could have inspired an interest in the culture um, because you joined the Peace Corps when? Right after college. So I think that might be a requirement for the Peace Corps. And and if people are interested, it's peacecorps.gov. And I mean, it's open to U.S. citizens. And it's it's similar to AmeriCorps, which is, uh, you know, a national service program, but, you know, U.S. focused. The Peace Corps works in like 60 plus countries and you go over there and work for two and a half years and you're you're paid sort of like a local salary. So I was paid like the equivalent of a local teacher. So I think I'd made like 300 bucks a month mm. um, in like very rural Morocco. Mm. Um, teaching English and running like sort of I called it like the passions club where kids could come and talk about whatever they wanted to talk about. And like one student was really interested in climate change and the education system in Morocco is pretty hierarchical where the, the teacher teaches and the students, you know, sit at their feet learning diligently. Uh, and this was sort of like an opportunity to, to flip that dynamic where, where the kids could talk about what they wanted to talk about. You went to college, you focused on international relations, and then you thought, I can use this in the Peace Corps. Um, Like that was always the plan or did that just kind of happen? Yeah. So, you know, I went to college uh, basically. So, you know, I I mentioned I grew up in Southern California and I went to college in Washington, D.C. And, you know, part of that was an interest, interest in political science. You know, that was. 2009 so that was the beginning of the Obama administration it was Mm -hmm. a very exciting time um but also you know just Washington DC is on the opposite side of the U.S. from California and I wanted to move as far away from my parents as possible and sort of you know see about making it on my own um and in that first semester took an intro to international affairs class and was really Mm. sold I was like oh this is so interesting and Greco-Roman art and architecture in Mm. Washington DC and it was like this like opportunity to sort of learn about how like soft power cultural diplomacy interacts between the US government and cultural institutions. So 
my professor from the art and architecture class, she was organizing a lecture uh, series um, all about destruction of cultural heritage by terrorists, um, you know, and for political reasons, right? To to sort of propagate a narrative about like history and culture and identity. Um, this was in the Middle East in North Africa. Um, and, and so like this was sort of this merging of these two worlds of an interest in international affairs and an interest in cultural heritage and, and sort of understanding how they fit together. College is this really wonderful opportunity for me to just bounce around and, mm -hmm. and sort of explore the things that I was interested in. You know, you sort of go to college with, or I went to college without like a clear path or a clear mm -hmm. idea of like what I was interested in mm -hmm. and came out of that like, oh, okay, this intersection between cultural heritage and international affairs and development, this is interesting. I want to see what this looks like in the real world. Um, and, and Peace Corps is this wild experience where, you know, like Morocco is a huge country. It's the size yeah. of California, basically. And, you know, there isn't sort of the capacity to have oversight of every single volunteer's day to day. So mm -hmm. I was living in a rural community of 5,000 people and, you know, basically had as much freedom to do as much or as little as I wanted day to day. And so, you know, some people really struggle with that level of freedom. I, I really thrived, I think. I remember one day coming out of the, you know, like the little apartment where I was living. And in the center of the town, Agare uh, is the town where I was living. There's like this three to 500 year old castle came out of my apartment one day and there was like smoke billowing out of this castle because people still live and work inside that castle. Um, and there had been some sort of electrical fire and, and luckily it was okay. And the people who lived there were okay. But I was like, oh, interesting. Like, you know, like cultural heritage, it's not like this dead thing. You know, it's not like you go, like I think for many of us, the way that we interact with like cultural heritage is you go to a museum and you look at these, you know, artifacts from civilizations long gone. And it's like, no, no, no. In, in Morocco, in this village where I was living, you know, people were still living inside of this, of this castle. And like, it, it has real resonance and salience for their, for their day-to-day -day lives. And so it was at that point where, you know, my Peace Corps service was coming to an end and I was looking at grad school and I was thinking, okay, you know, I've seen what this looks like in practice. Like, I, I think I want to go to grad school for international development and focus on cultural heritage, preservation and protection as a source of, of livelihoods and economic development. Which is what you did. Yeah, 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 that I got to do it. And you went back um, to D.C., right? I went back to D.C. I went to Georgetown this time. Um, you know, it's not like there was like the path, the well-blazed path of cultural heritage, and international development. It was like, OK, I'll study international development. And then each of my classes, I would bring sort of this lens, this interrogation of, of the role that cultural heritage could play. So interesting to hear you talk about it, because when you first said cultural heritage and you know, international relations, I honestly, I don't see how they go together, but you kind of forged that path and were like, well, actually they do go together and this is how, and I'm going to show you how. Luckily, you know, it wasn't like a totally new path to blaze. Um, you know, th there's a, there's a whole office at the state department that focuses mm -hmm. on, on cultural heritage for, you know, peace building and preservation and protection. And I was able to go, I was able to intern there during grad school and then, you know, was able to join that office as a contractor right out of grad school. And now you work in games. So I feel and, like yeah. we've missed, we've missed a step in the path here, Paul. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> you know what, like that's how it happened. Um, you know, it's funny cause I remember, I mean, going back to games for a moment here, if you'll let me after high school, I wasn't a big gamer. Um, you know, it was like, I, we had some time, my freshman year of college in particular, one of my roommates had a PlayStation and we played a lot of Call of Duty. But, you know, that was like really sort of a, like a short window that first semester or so of my freshman year of college. And then sort of like put games to the side, you know, like I would play casual games like Pokemon Go or in Morocco. I was just thinking about this. Like we all got obsessed with this game called uh, Neko Atsume, which is like kitty collector <laughs> which is like you know the cats like visit your little house and you like leave little treats for them to get more cats to come uh but like you know very casual games and then so fast forwarding back to the cultural heritage center um that office at the state department that i joined right out of grad school 
you know, COVID happened and we were sort of sitting around thinking, okay, well, how can we continue this work that we've started? How can we continue these different projects? And so there are two projects that I, I think are really sort of like informative for how I got to where I am now. So one, uh, we had been supporting a digital inventory of an archeological site. So right, inventorying everything at this archeological site so that if you know, a bad actor came and, and stole something, right, you could point back to the inventory if law enforcement recovered it and say, no, 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 this thing clearly came from this place. You know, we have this record. Uh, so then COVID happened, we're like, okay, well, the, the archeological team in the US couldn't go to Jordan to work with their counterparts. We're like, okay, what can we do? So we arranged for a remote training, a virtual training for three Jordanians to learn photogrammetry, right? The process of taking tens of thousands of photographs of an object to create a digital twin, right? So if you, I'm holding up my coffee mug, right? If you took, you know, if you took uh, 360 degrees of photos all around this coffee mug, you could create a digital twin. So the same thing, but you know, on the scale of an archeological site. Um, so we, we organized this remote training for these three Jordanians to learn photogrammetry. They went out, they did it. They took all the photographs of the site, but we didn't stop there. We put that online along with um, a virtual tour of the archeological site in English and in Arabic. So we, we recorded interviews with Jordanian tour guides talking about and sort of narrating a walking tour through this place. And then also um, we worked with six people who live there, um, three men and three women, to talk about what this, this archeological site means to them in terms of their contemporary lives, right? This is still a place where people go and picnic and gather um, and, you know, like hang out as a community. Um, it's still integral to their to their lives. And so again, we recorded these six stories uh, in English and in Arabic. And so we put the whole thing online, the, the you know, virtual tour, the audio tour, and the stories of what this place means to them in their contemporary lives. So it's sort of like a, a gaming experience a little bit where you can sort of like zoom in and zoom out and you can sort of navigate through this virtual tour. So that was sort of project number one. Right, this idea of building a whole of society effort around protecting and preserving cultural heritage by contextualizing it, right? Not sort of otherizing it as this ancient thing, but something that still has resonance. But then we also did a game jam. Um, we worked with uh, Kate and Tim over at Global Game Jam to um, you know, organize what we called the Cultural Heritage Game Jam. And so we had 900 participants from 72 countries created 116 games celebrating cultural diversity, raising awareness about those threats to heritage from theft, looting, trafficking, and destruction, and educating about how climate is impacting heritage. Um, you know, as opposed to sort of the, the typical, you know, long weekend or weekend long game jam, we did a month. And that's how long we felt people needed for that sort of like collaborative process between devs, storytellers, and, and cultural heritage experts to come together to build you know, something that wouldn't just be educational, but also fun. Um, sort of pointing to to Never Alone as sort of like the holy grail of the commercially successful social impact game, but like the fun social impact game. Uh, and the winning game that came out of that, um, it was about a Peruvian cultural heritage, the Chachapoya, that are an indigenous people that don't get sort of the, the same level of popularity that the Inca get. But the team that developed this game, they were from Peru, but also Sweden and Iran. And they created just this absolutely stunning game where you're sort of a, a young woman navigating through this lush, you know, Amazonian rainforest scape. And you're encountering objects as you navigate through this, this forest. And the first time you, you encounter an object, you're sort of coming at this from the perspective of, well, you know, these objects are just sort of rusting or rotting away here in the Amazon. I'm going to like allow them to be saved and preserved by putting them, you know, in a museum or selling them to somebody because the character is motivated by economic desperation. They're not motivated by malice. So the first time you encounter an object, you know, you hit the space bar and you save it. And then the next time you encounter an object, you protect it and then you keep it and then you take it and then you steal it and then you loot it, right? So like the character has this evolution of thought and, until there's sort of a crisis of conscience um, and the spirit of one of these objects confronts her and says, hey, you know, you're not saving these things. You're just a looter. Uh, and then the character puts them away. So, right, it was this beautiful game, really lush uh, landscape and soundscape. Um, and, you know, a really important message about how climate change is impacting and making heritage more vulnerable to looting and trafficking.
That's incredible. Games are such a great way of kind of getting that message across in a in a way that's visceral is like it even feels visceral as you describe it to me versus like reading a story about somebody who's looting something in brazil right right it, it's a way of bringing those stories to life i mean mm -hmm. you know game-based learning it doesn't need to be chocolate covered broccoli you can you can convey really important sophisticated points about cultural heritage about you know whatever it is that your message is but in a way that's fun and engaging um yeah I, like i'm just totally in love with with games for this purpose and you know going back to that early childhood of playing games you know i'd sort of set games aside in some way and in, in college thinking you know well there's you know i'm not going to become a dev you know this isn't like a possible career for me you know it's time to grow up and be serious um and you know here i am and yeah it's it's a blast bringing games to the to the u.s government so did the success of that then foster more projects around games uh, for you and, and where you were? Certainly for me, yes. Uh, Harmony Square, the first game from the Global Engagement Center, had already come out. Uh, it had come out in late 2020. And at that point, Cat Park was like maybe 50 to 80% done. Um, and so sort of project number one was getting Cat Park over the finish line, you know, sort of advocating for embassies to be using these games overseas for their for their public diplomacy programming so you know using the games to promote media literacy and civic engagement and to counter foreign propaganda and disinformation um, that's really the intent and the goal of these games and so now um they're in i think 19 languages number 20 like collectively between the two games uh 19 languages with number 20 coming soon and, and more languages being added all the time. That's amazing. Can you tell the people listening about Cat Park, <laughs> please? Yes. Okay. So in, in Cat Park, you play somebody who's new to town. The game sort of opens in on your pretty dingy apartment. And you get a message out of the blue. Hey, do you want to meet at this cafe? And you're like, well, okay. Like, it seems weird that somebody got my number, but let's go. And slowly you get sort of wrapped up in this conspiracy theory and this dis disinformation campaign to bring down this outrageous public works project, a park for cats, right? So like you're sort of like coming at this from the perspective of this is a waste of money. This is stupid. Why are people wasting? Why is the government wasting money on building a park for cats? And you are disparaging the cat and undermining public support for the cat park through memes, manipulated media, and sensational language. And so, you know, you sort of rile up people using these tools um, to turn against the cat park until ultimately people uh, burn down the cat park. And then at that point, the sort of Carmen San Diego character appears and says, you've been manipulated, kid. And, you know, sort of confronts you with the damage that you've done through your disinformation campaign. And so you have to try to undo the damage that you've done. Right, so you're, you're using sort of the inverse of your techniques. You're using the hot headlines feature, which you use to craft sensational language, to out yourself as the one who was spreading these conspiracy theories. Um, you use the meme machine, the sort of meme uh, creator tool inside of the game, to create a meme pointing out that it was ridiculous to attack this cat park. And then you use the... Um, image manipulator app to sort of undo the manipulation to show how an image ostensibly of like people protesting about um, recycling was turned into uh, this image of like, oh yeah, people are protesting this cat park. Everyone's doing it. You need to get in on this too. Um, but you know, where the game leaves the player is that it's really hard to put the genie back in the bottle. It's hard to undo the damage of your disinformation campaign. That's what I love so much about the game is that it really shows you how hard it is to undo the consequences of, of sharing these things. I think a lot of people certainly today see a meme that is hateful and they share it because on some level they may find it to be funny or amusing, but you don't realize the real harm it's causing and how hard it is to backtrack on that harm once it's been caused. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's a fun game, you know, it's 10 to 15 minutes to play and in addition to those new translations that I mentioned, I'm, what I'm really excited about is, you know, if you play the game soon, when you play the game in Arabic, the characters will look like they're from the Middle East and North Africa, and the plot will have changed. When you play the game in Spanish, the characters will look like they're from Latin America, 
and the plot will have changed. When you play the game in Amharic or Swahili, the characters will look like they're from sub-Saharan Africa, and again, the plot will have changed. So we're really trying to focus in on our, our target audiences and think about you know, how we can better convey this message. You know, still about a park for cats, but you know, adapted to make sure that it's it's going to resonate more. That's fantastic. Um, features are coming soon. Localization is so important uh, for getting those kinds of messages across. That's awesome that that they're willing to put in the time and effort and money to do that for each iteration of the game. It's a really fun opportunity that I have to be able to to advocate for games based learning for the State Department and how we can be using these tools more effectively. I see a lot of these kind of games for learning and and I remember just being blown away and I think that Paul thought I was lying to him because I was like, really, I think it's great. But now we know the truth is out. It's not a lie. It is. It's really a fantastic (laughs) game. I think there's like a a growing sense of um, acceptance that, yeah, Mm -hmm. you know, this is, there are three plus billion gamers in the world. This is a 300 plus billion dollar industry. You know, if we're, if we want to serve our, or meet our audiences where they are, we need to be in, in game, game adjacent spaces. Absolutely. And I mean, games as tools is something I often talk about as well. And it's really valuable to frame it that way that these are tools that we should be leveraging and using um, for the collective good, which sounds yeah. like yeah. you're doing. I want to end end the conversation today with maybe some advice for our listeners. Um, the motivation behind making this podcast was really the idea that everyone who gets into games, the path is winding, right? You're a mm-hmm. perfect example <laughs> of yeah. a winding path to end up where you are. So is there, I have a few questions. The first, I guess, would mm-hmm. be, is there something now looking back, maybe unexpected from your life, that's not game related that has served you really well in the role you're in now as a, as a media literacy advocate and kind of game maker. You know, that the cultural heritage work, the power of storytelling, you know, I think it's just this really untapped potential for the U S government and for development agencies to be more effectively using um, game-based tools and learning um, to promote, you know, economic development or to promote cultural heritage preservation. So much of international development, I think, is about implicitly identifying what is wrong or what is lacking with a particular place, right? So you invest in education because, because like, people are uneducated, or you invest in healthcare because people are unhealthy. But when you invest in cultural heritage, when you when you approach it as a partnership between the people who live there and the cultural heritage that they're invested in protecting and preserving, what you're saying is you have something special and unique and let's figure out how to work together to protect and preserve it. I also love how you talk about cultural heritage as a living, breathing, current, recent, we're living in it now thing. Um, mm-hmm. That I think that probably really resonates with the people who you talk to in this space, but it's also really resonating with me in the moment because you do think of like the old castle that no one lives in anymore, but that's not what you mean by cultural heritage exclusively. Right. No, no, no. Yeah. It could be these sort of like built temples and built castles. It could be the tangible objects that you encounter in a museum, but right. I mean, what you're getting at is intangible cultural heritage. The things that we sort of like almost don't even realize are are a part of our our lived experience day to day. These things that we do that we, we learn from our parents who learned it from their parents, or it's just sort of like the vibe in your community Mm Um, of like how you comport yourself and why you do this thing. Like, why does like um, this action, why does like sneezing, like why does that call for like this particular response? What I find really interesting about games and how people say, you know, it's a direct linear path and I must study this and I must go this way. Is that when you talk about your job and I've had feedback when I talk about my job as well, there's a real animation to it because it's something in us that's very passionate about what it is that we do. And it's not that we set out to do this it's that we took what we love and we found a way to navigate that into games yeah yeah like everyone has a story to tell and it's just a matter of equipping them with the tools and in many cases the access access to finance to tell those stories one last question before we go paul Mm, 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 mm. if we do this interview again if we're lucky enough to do this again in 10 years what would you hope that we are saying about your most recent save i would hope that development agencies, including the the places where I get to work, you know, are are investing in games as a you know strategic opportunity for supporting livelihoods, for supporting education, 
and for for telling stories that need to be told and deserve to be told. Thank you so much for spending time with me today and um, and sharing your story and your journey. This podcast was produced by Sightgeist, a multimedia content production studio that focuses on the intersection of games, science, and pop culture, created by Rachel Cowart. And if you would like more Sightgeist content, you can find me on YouTube at Sightgeist, P-S-Y-C-H-G-E-I-S-T. And I also have a mostly monthly newsletter on Substack where you can find if you search for the same name. Until next time, be excellent to each other and always cite your sources. That's so interesting about, really about when you talk about cultural heritage, about how people still lived in the castle. I was like, yeah, I was thinking about the game Unpacking. Have you played the game Unpacking? Mm -mm, No. You should play it. It's a great game, but um, it's a little indie game. You can play in a couple hours, but The game is you're unpacking people's stuff. So you start in like your childhood Mm. bedroom and you're unpacking like childhood stuff. And then you go to college and then you go to like your boyfriend's apartment. Then clearly you break up with your boyfriend and you're back on your own. And then you're in another like and it's all just told through like the inference storytelling of what stuff you're pulling Uh out of the boxes. And I and I kept thinking about that as like, is that a reflection of cultural heritage? Like it's interesting Mm -hmm. in the childhood bedroom, there's a dreidel. Right. And it's like you can tell so much about a story just from the stuff and then the houses hmm. change and at the end there's a house and then there's like a baby's room. And so it's like the story is just told okay. from, from the things around you. Hmm. Interesting. You'd like uh, it. My, I, yeah, my, my friends make fun of me that like exclusively the games on, on switch that I play are like games about depression. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, awesome. Yeah. I mean like what that's with that, like packing and unpacking, it sounds a lot like the mechanism in Florence where you're doing mm. something similar. Or um, I just I finished the old man's journey, um, which is like you're an old man uh, mm-hmm. and you're like trying to get to you get a letter and you as the player do not see the letter you have no idea of the context of the letter and you're just trying to like sort of navigate these these maps right and it's mm. uh, it's it's I'm trying to think is that it's it's two dimensional. But like what's crazy is you can sort of like move the roads or the mountains up and down. So you're like connecting your path. Interesting. And then you're like sort of learning more and more about this man's life um, as you as you like connect these roads. Um, Right. Like the metaphor of like climbing mountains for your Mm -hmm. family is like they they really beat you over the head with that uh, (laughs) metaphor in the game. But I love it. Um, and then you like you sort of like reconnect with your estranged daughter and your your oh, wife right before she passes away. Oh, interesting! Um, so it's a really beautiful game. Yeah, um, it sounds. Or really I was nice. I haven't played this game, but I want to play it. Uh, Heaven's Vault, which mm. is all about deciphering like a, an unknown language. Um, mm. Yeah, Again, they're, back they're with archaeology. I'm telling you, you belong. <laughs> Indiana Jones. They just came out with a new one, or or maybe they were just demoing it, like a VR. Yeah, Indiana I don't know if Jones? that's come out or not. Remember the first Prince of Persia I played must have been a PlayStation Two. It was like the remake. It was like the big remake when they came and made a new Prince Sands of Persia. Of time. Yeah, I, Sands of Time. That's it. I was blown away by the mechanics of that game. Yeah. Um, my memory of that is just really doing like, oh my god, this is something new and something novel. And um, that, yeah, like the yeah. the dagger of time where you're yeah. like you're some, uh, ingesting magic sand that then you can use to like rewind if you really yeah. mess something up and you're gonna die like that you run the wall running yeah so oh, good the, the wall running yeah that game that game was excellent game. yeah it was excellent and then although i from your childhood i got smash brothers was like the big one for me well i remember spy vs spy just because i always lost but like it's funny how there's like certain games that really are just like that was the one that sparked my love for games and being the third brother i'm shocked it was mm. a brawler game <laughs> Yeah, I mean yeah. that was like the safe outlet for yeah, us. To yeah, like, right. You know, to get all the fight, anger out you know, yeah. in our rooms or whatever. Yeah, that's <laughs> so funny. Um, all right, I have another meeting now. I have to go. This has been great. I guess I could stop you. recording. Oh my god, thank you so much for doing this. You can this. include some of these gems in the outro. I will. <laughs>